through them in detail before we go into the discussion, but also to kind of break into one a little bit more as it relates to important concepts you may have heard in other courses to build upon our knowledge through semester of revolution. So for the first reading, it's important to note, this is reading 54 from the evolution text by Ridley in terms of chimps and humans. So you may have been exposed to this in other courses or heard this. And there's a number of different studies that have come up um, after this, this was written as well in terms of the number of sequence genomes. So that you've probably heard this quote, we share close to 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees, probably our closest living relative. And in 2012, bonobos were actually added to the list for this. So the take home message is this is kind of a really good way to think about how organismal evolution and ecology kind of go along with molecular information. So using that information to kind of look at evolution from a genetics perspective is kind of important. Just a little bit of background there related to the King and Wilson reading where that quote actually comes from. Now the other reading Krogman for the scars of human evolution is actually interesting. There's a number of other examples for this you can find. I won't get into detail on those, but oh, my aching back, why do our backs hurt? Are they uh, good or bad design? That's sort of something that's mentioned in the video I posted from your inner fish and also from this reading. And also this idea of our bodies maladapted for modern life. In terms of other examples, one might be our heart, four feet above the ground, sore feet, other examples, wisdom teeth, our, our teeth that may cause issues. Think about before the advent of modern science and dentistry in terms of issues that might have led to infection. So there's a lot of interesting scars of human evolution just within our own species. And so this kind of relates also to as we move away from a hunter-gatherer society as a species to modern day agriculture. So just some ideas here of some of the videos. I'll also talk about the origins of, of homo hominids, homo sapiens, in terms of looking at other different types of ways that organisms such as humans might have actually gathered food, moving to a more agrarian society, moving to a post-industrial or modern day society, what most of us think of. So the idea of, are you gonna spend 40 hours a week on a chair at a computer, right? How is that gonna affect your back and these other scars of evolution? So I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about that in terms of outlining that as an overview for the, this week's reading. So our last reading for this week is by Ernest Mayer on species concepts and their application. So you've probably been exposed to this idea that biological species concept is the most accepted. And keep in mind that species really are the end product of evolution via natural selection. Some of the take home messages from this reading for this week in evolution, the idea of problems with this particular species concept, even though it's the most accepted. What do you do when there's information lacking? What do you do with species that reproduce via asexual reproduction? How do you deal with hybrids? And so this is sort of some food for thought for this reading by Ernest Mayer. So a quick review in terms of what a species is, just to show you very briefly here, we are talking about the typology species concept. This has more commonly been worked into the morphology species concept. So when Ernest Mayer in the reading for this week is talking about typological species concept. He's really talking about the morphological species concept, looking specifically at morphology to describe or understand what a species is or what it isn't. Is a species A, is a species B? So he's talking about morphology species concept. Obviously there are some issues with a morphology or typology species concept because it largely ignores evolution. Species are not unchanging entities, so it's difficult to interpret in that context. Also, how do you deal with sexual dimorphism across species or taxa when the sexes differ morphologically? So you may have very different males and females of the same species. That's obviously an issue if you're using typology or morphology to call something a species. Some other examples for alternative morphs, even within the own species, or even within different types of males, if they're in breeding condition, etc., there might be different morphologies even within our own species. So having a morphology species concept has some issues and problems. Also, you have variation across different areas. Here's one example where we talk about just briefly a climb or a change in morphology along an environmental gradient. So if you're using morphology or typology to look at these as their own unique species, then you might see some vast differences based on uh, 
variances in ecological habitat or even elevation, number of precipitation. So that's going to be a good problem for this type of species concept. Some other examples might be even the latitude. So where do you find this species? There's going to be some differences in terms of maybe how much, how large their wings are able to grow in a set season. So that's going to be an issue for any kind of typology or once again, morphology species concept. There's also a number of different species that we term as cryptic. That means some species are very similar morphologically, but they differ in other important ways, such as the Western versus Eastern meadowlark. So you've probably been exposed to this. I'm not really going to read this out loud. You've probably been exposed to the biological species concept, this idea of a group of populations that could potentially interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring that is reproductively isolated from other populations. So once again, the biological species concept, the most widely accepted, the one you're kind of force fed in terms of reading a biology textbook, but it also hinges largely on reproductive isolation. So Ernest Mayer was actually very important for defining and coming up with the biological species concept. That's why we're reading one of his works in the Ridley evolution text, because this really is an important contribution by Ernest Mayer to biology in general. And so in 1942, he proposed the biological species concept, and that's probably the term you're most familiar with from taking a number of different biology classes, or even possibly learning high school. So you've been th thinking about humans for a moment here. There's tremendous morphological variation within Homo sapiens even, but all humans can obviously potentially interbreed. In contrast, some species are very similar morphologically, but cannot interbreed. So once again, this biological species concept really gets at reproductive isolation as part of its definition. So to revisit this idea of similar species are using a morphological species concept versus biological species concept versus any other species concept. Here is a bird example, once again, with the Western meadowlark and Eastern meadowlark. And you can see here their, their different species ranges in the Eastern versus the Western. However, sometimes there is some overlap there geographically where you do have interbreeding occurring. So you sometimes have hybrids, but there's other factors at play that obviously affect their offspring with low fertility. But something interesting to think about in terms of what makes the eastern meadowlark a different species versus western meadowlark. Here's another example of a mechanism that keeps species such as the spotted skunk into two distinct species, the western versus eastern spotted skunk. So you have what's called temporal isolation or really timing of reproduction because one breeds in the winter, one breeds in the summer. More interesting what might happen in the future if they overlap more potentially hybridized. So something interesting just to consider in terms of species concepts with another organismal example. The paper that you'll read this week has some issues in terms of dealing with the biological species concept. It's difficult to apply also to fossil data. So it's difficult to really get at reproductive isolation looking at just the fossil for obvious reasons. Also species that exist in time and space there's no real mechanism for the biological species concept to have a time component. And also lastly, this issue or problem, what do we do with organisms that reproduce via asexual reproduction? That's an issue. In terms of asexual reproduction, one example here is a one kind of specific rotifer. They haven't actually reproduced sexually for over 80 million years. Each individual is reproductively isolated. So it's interesting to think about in terms of applying species concepts which species concept fits perhaps what kind of taxa. There's a number of different species concepts. I'm not going to get into all of these, but just keep in mind, this is just sort of one of the more common different examples of the various different kinds of species concepts that also include evolutionary species concepts, which talks about the smallest evolutionary significant unit, ecological species concept, phylogenetic species concept, so a number of these have also been proposed, but they really haven't picked up quite as much traction as the biological species concept. So there are a vast number of other species concepts, not just the biological species concept or some of the other ones I just mentioned. Some of these are sort of side components of more well-recognized species concepts, but there are a number of species concepts in use today. There's a number of different papers on this. It's actually interesting literature on this in terms of what's
a good working species concept? Can we really have a unifying species concept in biology when we have so many different unique and diverse organisms? Kind of an important question to think about. This is just a graph showing a couple of different species concepts. The one you're more familiar with there on the top, biological species concept. There's also some subcategories there in terms of isolation species concept, recognition species concept, ecological, evolutionary, phylogenetic. There's a number of these other species concepts that really have been, in terms of science and evolution, debated in terms of when, how they might be applied to different organisms. So there's a number of different literature out there for different species concepts. So to end this quick video, just a challenge question, can there be one species concept? Can you come up with your own species concept perhaps? Which one would you pick as your favorite species concept? Also, can how would you explain hybrids? So hybrids such as man, bear, pig, and really ultimately to think about Highlander, can there really only be one? There can be only one species concept, yes or no. Can it apply to different taxa? Kind of something to think about and keep in mind this is something that evolutionary biologists, biologists, scientists have wrestled with for a number of years. So this kind of places hopefully some more context of this week's reading. With that, have a great time looking over this material for this week. Mm -hmm.